Welcome to the Shepherd's Pie, a slice of hope to raise faithful kids, where we focus on topics that impact young people today. I'm Antony Barone Kolenk. I'm a father of five who served in the Air Force for 21 years. I'm now a law professor and a columnist for Practical Homeschooling Magazine. I'm also the author of The Harwood Mysteries, an inspirational medieval fiction series for kids aged 10 and up. Here on The Shepherd's Pie, we want to inform, inspire, and help you to raise happy, healthy, faithful kids, whether you're a teacher, a homeschooling parent, a pastor, anyone. In today's episode, I speak with author Theone Bell about her novel, The Woman in the Trees by Tan Publishing. We talk about the nation's greatest wildfire in the 1800s and the first approved Marian apparition in the United States, Our Lady of Good Help at the Champion Shrine in Wisconsin. And I review the 2020 movie Fatima based on the real life events in Portugal in 1917. As a Christian, there are so many amazing events and miracles that are recounted in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, the miracles of Moses, the judges, the prophets, the incredible miracles that Jesus performed and then the apostles performed after him in his name. And in the modern world, we often hear of modern miracles occurring, many of them involving apparitions of Mary, the mother of Jesus, including the most popular ones in Lourdes, France, and Fatima, Portugal. But not many have heard about the first approved Marian apparition in the United States, Our Lady of Good Help in Wisconsin. In our interview segment today, Theone Bell discusses her book, The Woman in the Trees, which is a teen novel focused on not only the events of the Civil War, of the Great Fire in Wisconsin in the 1800s, but also the events surrounding the miracle associated with Champion Shrine and Our Lady of Good Help in Wisconsin. <music> Today I am with Theone Bell, an author who lives in Houston with her husband and three children. She's a homeschooling mom with a master's degree in journalism, and her first novel, The Woman in the Trees, was published by Tan Publishers in 2020, and it's inspired by her experience visiting the Shrine of Our Lady of Good Help, which is the site of America's first church-approved Marian apparition. Her book is written for middle schoolers, although it's been enjoyed by people of all ages. Theone, welcome to The Shepherd's Pie. Thanks, Tony. It's great to be here. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. How is it you were studying culture and religion all around the world? Well, I was into journalism ever since middle school and uh, went to college for it. And I just really wanted to go abroad, learn about different people. I started off in Egypt and I went into Israel and I went to England and France. And then I went into a few other places to look at some of the Eastern religions. So then you came back to the United States and I know you mentioned that you visited the Shrine of Our Lady of Good Help. Um, now, some of our listeners might not be familiar with that shrine. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I was married, newly married, and I had two petitions um, that I wanted to bring somewhere. So we got on the internet and we decided we were going to do a pilgrimage and we found this site in 2013. So we drove out there and really had no idea what we were going to find. It was approved in 2010. And so it's still fairly small and quiet shrine. When we arrived, we found what seemed almost like a closet we didn't know that it was actually the site of the apparition itself until you enter the room and all of a sudden you're just flooded with peace. Once I had felt that and experienced that, I knew that this site was special. Well, then both of our prayer petitions were answered. I wanted to have another child and my husband had been waitlisted in a philosophy department and he still had faith and hope in Our Lady that something would happen to let him in. And so he got in and we moved to Canada for that program. So she became a patron for us and I began to look into the apparition. 
So the apparition happened to a young lady named Adele Bryce, an immigrant from Belgium. Belgians came to Wisconsin in the 1850s and they moved into areas that were so densely wooded that they they spent decades cutting those trees down. Trees that were six feet across. They lived really secluded out in the woods. So Adele was walking to a grist mill some miles away from her home. She was bringing wheat with her when she saw Our Lady for the first time. She didn't know it was Our Lady yet, but she described Our Lady as um, very bright light that took the form of a woman. And she had 12 stars around her head and she had a yellow sash and blonde hair. And of course, Adele was terrified. <laughs> so she went and talked to her parents and they thought it might be, you know, the apparition of uh, someone in purgatory wanting prayers. Well, then she saw the apparition again. Same thing. Mary just appeared between two trees on the trail and, and then disappeared. So she finally asked her priest what she should do about this, and he gave her the courage to speak to the apparition. When Our Lady appeared the third and final time, she uh, Adele asked, who are you and what do you want with me? And then that's where we get the message of Our Lady of Good Help. So there's two main parts to that message. The first one is about conversion. So she said she introduced herself to Adele as the Queen of Heaven who prays for the conversion of sinners, and she told Adele to go and convert them and to tell them to do penance. And then she said, gather the children in this wild country and teach them what they should know for salvation. So that second part was about educating the children in their faith. And uh, Adele dedicated the rest of her life to doing that. She sometimes trekked 50 miles away just to arrive at a settler's home and teach the children. Eventually, she built a chapel on the spot where the apparition happened. She built a school. She had the support of her priest. She didn't always have the support of the local bishops. And then as confirmation of this uh, apparition, there was a miracle in 1871. I don't know if you know, if you've ever heard of the Great Peshtigo Fire, but it's known as the most devastating fire in American history. Over a thousand people died. The part of Wisconsin that was just totally decimated was the size of Delaware, and it happened on the 12th anniversary of that third apparition. So on that night, some of uh, the settlers, not knowing where to go, they fled to the chapel, and they Adele was there, and they processed around the chapel yard with Our Lady's statue, praying their rosaries all night long. And you have to understand how bad this was. Things were just combusting. It was so hot and everything was wiped out. The flames would have just chased them to this chapel and just been surrounding them all night long. I've read accounts of it that say, you know, the smoke was so bad that they'd have to change directions while they were processing because they couldn't breathe. They did this all night long and in the morning a downpour came and everything inside the chapel fence was unharmed. Every person, even animals, had fled in there. And um, if you looked out from the chapel fence, everything was black and charred. There was really nothing left in the area. Wow. So, so this increased uh, pilgrimages to the site. That happened in 1871, and it wasn't until 2010 that it was approved by the local bishop. He made an official statement. And then a few years later, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops designated the shrine as a national shrine. So it is official. The only thing it needs now is Vatican approval. <laughs> now, you were out there. Could you see at this? I mean, now this is 150 years later. So... Um, are there any remnants of the fire yes. you know, consequences still out there? I'm not sure you'd see it in the landscape, but they have at the Shrine Museum parts of the original trees that were seen as the sacred trees where Mary appeared. They have parts of the chapel fence where the burning or the charring is on one side of the fence and not the other side. And they have, there's a priest from farther up north who visited the chapel and he wrote about the miracle and uh, promoted Adele's visions. So all of that stuff is there. And then if you're just interested in the fire itself, because it's a very fascinating piece of history, there's a Peshtigo Fire Museum close to the shrine. And they're not affiliated, but a lot of those stories are uh, at that museum too. Now, the book that you wrote, The Woman in the Trees, uh, which I have a copy of, and it's very beautifully done. 
Tan Publishers really put this together very nicely, and it, it reads really well. It, it reads mostly, uh, interestingly, I, the way you did this, uh, you know, it, it starts with this fire, but then you sort of backtrack in this young girl's life and kind of fill in um, a lot. Talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the book and, and why you approach the story this way. Well, I know that today's children don't have the same attention span, I think, as they used to. And I knew that I really needed to pull them in right away. And I think, I mean, other than Mary coming to earth, I think the fire is definitely something that kind of gets your blood boiling. And so right away, you are caught up in this chaos. And then I thought, once they're there, let's bring them back. And there's there's a lot of other things that happen in the book. It spans 18 years. I really wanted to be as accurate as possible. So I was talking with the communications coordinator at the shrine and the shrine archivist, and I was reading research papers and um, historical documents and just trying to, I, I really actually love Adele Bryce and wanted to know her. I write about my main character, but a lot of it is Adele's story because Adele had to make that sea voyage from Belgium and she had to clear the land with her family and she would have lived through the cholera epidemic and the civil war and then the persecutions that she experienced as she was trying to spread the word of this apparition and catechize the children. So all of that is in there, but my main character, her name is Slaney, and she is in the opening scene trying to save her family from this devastating fire. But then we go back and we get to know her as a young girl, and we kind of get to see her grow up through all of these experiences as a pioneer. And at one point, the first scene I ever had for the book was a little girl in front of a fire with her mother in a cabin. And this strange woman knocks on the door and it's Adele Bryce. Now, one thing about Adele that's a little off-putting is that she lost one of her eyes in an accident with a poison as a kid. It's called lye and it was used to make soap. And she was a bigger woman and just a formidable person. And so she's outside this door and they open it and she says, I want to teach your children the faith or, you know, whatever she would have said, I've seen the Virgin Mary. And I just tried to wrap my head around how odd that would be and where that could go. So in the story, there's been some loss in the family. The mother is very bitter. She's not very nice. And she doesn't want anything to do with Adele or the church. But Slaney hungers for more knowledge about this apparition, eventually knowledge about the faith. Her and her father are the ones who really uh, chase chase Adele and, and chase the truth down and use it to deal with their suffering, the loss they've gone through and the suffering that they have in their struggle to survive in the wilderness. And so the story is, in the end, I set out to tell people about this apparition, but it ended up being about how people can find comfort and healing in in our faith yeah and i noticed also i mean you really did spend a lot of time you know showing the life of immigrant pioneers especially from belgium in the middle of the 19th century and you really kind of show what life would have been like for them uh, leading up to this fire uh, what kind of research did you have to do to uh, to get all those details right the amazing thing about it is the Belgian community in Wisconsin has been studied a lot in the last 30 years because they were such a big community and they really held on to their beliefs. I've actually hunted down a woman whose great, great grandfather and then her great grandfather, they had fled to the shrine during the fire. And I'm talking to her. I've, I've found her great grandfather in the directory of immigrants. It's been a very exciting thing to do, and I'm very grateful for all the research that's already been done. Bringing this back to our kids then, you did so much research on this. You could have written, it seems like, several books from different ways, documentary, nonfiction books. You could have written books for adults, uh, but you chose to focus on middle schoolers. So what is it about that age range that you felt uh, that, that it's important for them to know about all these different events that you're describing? I really feel like books have a big role in shaping children. The Catholic worldview is just under attack 
from all sides in this culture. We call it post-Christian culture. So our Christian beliefs are not being supported in television, in uh, news media, in most of the books that come out. I mean, we used to love going to Barnes and Noble and just grabbing a book serendipitously and reading it. And now I have to look at absolutely everything that my children want to read or watch. So I really feel like children are going to mimic the characters that they love in our culture. So whether those are athletes or they're reading Greek myths or superhero books, they're going to mimic those characters. It's just how humans work. I feel like we need to surround them with media that is well done, but also based on our Christian ethic and our Christian worldview. And from those, our children can learn the correct perspective of life and why they're here and who God is and who they are. Uh, I have a quote that I really love. It's from True Devotion to Mary by St. Louis de Montfort. And he said, uh, nothing can so powerfully excite us to live holy lives as the example of those who are holy. Example convinces us of the possibility of virtue, makes it practicable and easy, and offers it to us already illustrated in others, and as it were, prepared for our exercise. So I think when you write these books about young people struggling for the faith and you show them how the faith can be interwoven into their lives, especially into their suffering, they have a vision of what their own life can be. And they can see that it's, it's not impossible. They can see how the faith can be used for them. I set out to write this book for younger kids because I feel like they don't have a lot of options for that. They, they're getting more of them, though. As your show has shown me even, there are a lot of great Catholic authors out there. Um, I feel like the Catholic fiction world has grown a lot since I set out to write for it. And that's something that we can be proud of. Yeah, there are a lot of great Catholic uh, authors and Christian authors writing books for teens, uh, you know, CatholicTeenBooks.com. I talk about, you know, frequently yeah. on the show, there's a, a lot of great authors there. Still, families don't know about these resources out there and, and they, uh, you know, they need to hear more about them. That's why it's important to, to spread the word. Let me ask this. So, so the fire that, mm -hmm. you know, the book starts out on um, the worst fire on the anniversary of the apparition. Was the fire deemed as a judgment from God or how does the fire fit into the mold of, you know, the whole apparition? Well, I know from, from stuff I've read that people of that time did see that as the chastisement. Remember Mary's words, if they do not convert and do penance, my son will be obliged to punish them. And so I think like the priest who visited and then tried to promote the apparition and visits to the shrine, he also wrote that this was the chastisement. And we don't have it directly from Adele's mouth that she thought it was the chastisement, but that has been the general understanding of people who write about this apparition. It makes sense. The only place in the area that wasn't destroyed was the shrine. What I've learned from starting out with this apparition and then going back to look at several others in the last 150 years, what it has given me is an understanding that Jesus has not stopped speaking to us. I think in our culture, they, they tell us, oh, maybe there's a God, but he doesn't care about us. Some of them tell us there isn't a God at all, or he doesn't matter. But he is still chasing us, and he's sending his mother to do it. It's shown me how much he loves us and still loves us. I feel like you can say that, you can learn that, you can read the Bible, but there's something about knowing that she was here. And, and you visit the shrine and you can feel it in that room. I think there's something about that that can give you strength and that can enhance your faith and make you more courageous about it. There are 16 Vatican approved apparitions and there are 10 Bishop approved apparitions in the world. In the 1900s alone, we've got Fatima, we have two in Belgium, we have one in Rwanda, one in Japan. These are all signs of God's mercy toward us. Some of the, the messages can, can seem scary, like punishments to us, but none of it's new. God, this is what God has been saying. You know, we read it all the way to the beginning of scripture. So this is an ecumenical show. So I do have some listeners who might uh, not be Catholic. Yep. And uh, obviously a Marian apparition is uh, definitely a sensitive topic that not all yes. Christians are going to, you know, embrace. 
as far as your your book, The Woman in the Trees, and even sort of the message of these apparitions, how do you see that interplaying with people who might not, you know, be Catholic? I mean, are, are there messages or Christian themes that you think they could also benefit from uh, your story? Of course. Um, I was definitely skeptical. I was Catholic, but Marian apparitions were for someone else. You know, they were for other Catholics. I had never really looked into them. I just, I was skeptical. So I totally understand that. I come from Protestant background. All my family is Protestant. And even my own mother, who's my biggest supporter, she's Protestant and doesn't fully embrace the Catholic view of Mary. But I think what I learned from digging into the history here is that it's real. If you look at the facts, you have to say a whole lot of people are lying. You have to say that miracles didn't happen that have been verified. There are miracles that doctors have verified, healings that have happened. So I think first, I've been told the book reads like Little House on the Prairie with a Marian apparition. <laughs> so it's an educational book from a historical perspective, for sure. But I think, A, it's a good way for people to understand our faith if they don't understand what Catholics think about Mary. And B, I think it's hard to say there isn't something to this story if you look at the history. And at the end of the book, I have a, an epilogue that talks about what I used that was true in the story. The names of people who are real people, you can Google them, you can read their testimonies. And I think all of that becomes hard to ignore. So as we're heading into our last few minutes, what kind of advice might you have to, uh, to a parent or anybody working with kids who are trying to convey to them a topic such as a Marian apparition, especially one that uh, talks about God punishing and chastisements, things that could be frightening to kids. Um, have you found that, that there's a way to be able to convey this uh, in a way that you think is best for children? Yes. I think that if you put an ounce of joy into everything you're teaching your children about the faith, it can make these things a lot easier to handle. I have three children and we homeschool. I have to do all their catechism lessons and everything they're going to learn about religion. And that can be very hard to explain to the children. I mean, and it's part of Our Lady of Good Help's message. If you have a full view of what the church teaches, of what Jesus said in the Bible, if you take that full view, it can be scary. But at the same time, you're never going to question that God loves you. And I feel like knowing that helps to hear some of these chastisements and punishments and things like that. But also, this is serious stuff. This is eternity. So I think children also need to hear that there are consequences for your actions. So I think if you balance these kind of messages and some of the scripture verses about hell and things like that with a genuine relationship with Christ and your kids see that he's a real person who loves you, I think it's easier for them to run to him and to practice the faith with him than to just turn away and be scared because of some of these stories. Right, right. All right. Well, if people want to get a hold of your book or learn more about you and your writing, where can they find you and where can they get your book? So my book is out with Tan. You can obviously find it on Tan's website or Amazon. If you want to know more about it, I have tons of reviews on my website, which is theonibell.com. It's T-H-E-O-N-I-B-E-L-L.com. I'm also on Patreon and I'm also on LinkedIn. Theoni, thank you so much for being on the show today. This has really been fascinating. And again, I've got a copy of the book in front of me. It's just beautifully done. I know that seems very accessible to young readers also. And uh, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me, Tony. This was great. In the entertainment review segment today, I discuss the movie Fatima, released in 2020 with some guest appearances by well-known actors Sonia Braga and Harvey Keitel, but mostly starring fairly unknown cast. Now, there have been a lot of books and movies about the miracle at Fatima in 1917 involving apparitions of the Virgin Mary to three children, Lucia, Jacinta, and Francisco. 
one of the approved Marian apparitions by the Catholic Church, not to mention the miracle of the sun, which is portrayed at the end of this movie because it is one of the most documented miracles with thousands of people present, news reporters, atheists, and people of all sorts in attendance. This is a movie you definitely want to have your family see if you're interested at all in Our Lady of Fatima and the story of these three amazing children, and especially Lucia, who lives a long life as a Carmelite nun, and which forms a backdrop for how the movie is actually filmed, with Harvey Keitel playing essentially an atheistic professor writing a book on Fatima, interviewing Sister Lucia, and recalling the events of Fatima. So the movie kind of flashes back and forth between this interview which is a fictionalized interview, and the actual events. The movie is filmed like a state-of-the-art Hollywood blockbuster, and you see the amount of suffering and opposition that especially Lucia went through, especially during the time of the apparitions. It's a great movie to show people who are not necessarily already very knowledgeable about Fatima, because it does a nice job of just sort of trying to present this girl's story without a lot of preachiness or preaching about Mary or anything like that. Now, those of you who are big fans of Fatima may take a little bit offense to this movie because there is some poetic license. There are several of the Fatima-related appearances that are not presented in the movie or that are synthesized in the movie in some way. Mary, actually, in her apparition, she walks over to the children as opposed to coming to rest upon the branches of a tree. But putting that aside, the movie is still worth seeing and it's definitely still worth having kids see it. Uh, this is the kind of movie you could watch at a youth group. So Fatima 2020, you can find it on Netflix and other streaming services like Prime. And definitely worth a watch with your family. That's all the time we have for the show today. We spoke with Theoni Bell about her book, The Woman in the Trees and some of the true events upon which it is based. And we reviewed the movie Fatima, about one of the most documented miracles in history occurring in Portugal in 1917. Again, this is Anthony Barone Colank, and this has been The Shepherd's Pie. If any of you listening today have a question for me or a topic you'd like to have us cover on the show, please drop me a line on my website at antonycolank.com. That's A-N-T-O-N-Y-K-O-L-E-N-C dot com. Also, if you visit my website, you can learn more about my historical fiction series for kids, The Harwood Mysteries. I'll end, as always, with my wife's favorite scripture quote from Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. May the Lord bless and keep you this week.